Hello my beautiful friends, welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, my name is Cammie. If you are not new, my name is still Cammie. I have not changed it. I will let you know if I do change it. But for now, it's still Cammie. And today, we're not talking about MLM. We're getting back into the true crime stuff. And <laughs> today we're gonna be talking about a case that is part of my Horrible Mothers series. And y'all know how I feel about mothers that harm their children. This falls under that category. So if you don't want to hear me rip this woman to absolute shreds and drag her for filth, don't watch this video because I have very strong opinions about the diagnosis of Munchausen by proxy. I recognize that it's a real diagnosis, but I still think it falls under that diagnosis umbrella spectrum of just because you have a mental illness does not give you the right to harm someone that has been entrusted in your care, such as a child or the elderly, especially not a child. And also especially not the elderly. It just, just don't hurt people that are entrusted in your care. I have no sympathy for these people. So I think they're scum, just like I think anyone who harms a child is scum. But I especially think there's something horrific about someone that harms someone that is relying on them for care. So if you don't want to hear me talk about how I don't have sympathy for the poor little child abuser, then don't watch this because you're not going to be happy with it. So today we're talking about Lacey Spears. Have you heard of her? Before we get started though, don't forget to hit that like button and the subscribe button and don't forget to follow me on all of my social media and then don't forget to hit that bell button. That way you'll be notified every single time that I upload and Let's get into it. So Lacey Spears was born in Decatur, Alabama, and it's a pretty large city. In 2010, it had a population of 55,000 people. But Lacey was born on the Castle Air Force Base in California, which is no longer there. So she was raised in Decatur, but she was born on this Air Force that shut down in 1995. So this Castle Air Force Base is about 115 miles south of Sacramento and her parents are Tina and Terry and she was one of three children. So she was born on this Castle Air Force Base or whatever, whatever it's called, Castle something, Bowser's Castle. She was born in Bowser's Castle, Castle Grayskull. <laughs> but once Lacey was born, the whole entire family moved to Decatur, which is really strange because it was one of the poorest towns in America at that time. But the reason that they moved is because their grandmother had this ranch that they all wanted to live on. So that way they could all be closer as a family, I guess. Which I don't get because this entire family was miserable. They all like hated each other. <laughs> The parents were not close to each other, and Terry had celiac disease, Crohn's disease, and he was just super not around because he was more concerned about his health issues, which I get. You know, I had cancer, and I'm diabetic, and I had epilepsy, so I, I totally get being concerned about your health, but I also feel like if you're going to have children, you need to take care of your children. Meanwhile, Tina had type 1 diabetes and she just didn't get along with the kids at all and was just a really unaffectionate woman. So while other mothers would like shower their kids with hugs and kisses, she wasn't like that at all. She kind of just didn't want anything to do with these children. So this kind of led Lacey to becoming a really a loner because she was the youngest of three kids, like I said. Her teenage siblings didn't really want anything to do with her. You know how teenagers are. They don't want to play with their baby sibling, with their like 10 year old sibling. So she kind of filled her time with Lifetime movies and her favorite show was Seventh Heaven. Do y'all remember that show? That's what she really loved to do. And she also, because of the fact that she didn't really have any friends to play with, she kind of adopted dolls as her makeshift family. Her focus was really more on American Girl dolls and I can't blame her. I loved American Girl dolls whenever I was a kid. I still think American Girl dolls are like amazing. <laughs> Lacey was weird about it. So every single day the dolls had to be dressed differently and their hair had to be brushed and she treated these dolls like real people which 
same girl. I was like that with my dolls. But she didn't want anyone to touch her dolls, which I get it. American Girl dolls are very expensive. And kids don't have any respect for other kids' things. And if you tell them no, then they'll purposely break things. So I get it. Here's the difference, though. Lacey <laughs> took it a step further and literally tried to strangle a girl that touched her doll. Like... <laughs> Left handprints on this girl's neck and everything. <laughs> Lacey sounds like she hissed at people. For some reason, though, for some reason, though, this girl that Lacey tried to strangle stayed friends with her. Which, if someone tried to strangle me as a kid, but even now as an adult, if someone tried to strangle me, <laughs> I would not stay friends with them. I'd be like, yo, I gotta go. I gotta move. I gotta move country states. I gotta move cities. I gotta move states. I gotta move countries. I can't be here because I think you're gonna kill me. So on Lacey's 12th birthday, Lacey just out of the blue says, yo, it's time to grow up. We can't play with dolls anymore. That's for kids. And that's when Lacey became a real teacher's pet. Like, you know whenever a teacher forgets that she had assigned homework for the whole class and then at the end of class, some one kid is like, hey, what about the homework? That was Lacey. She was the type that would goad you into doing something and then tattle on you for doing it. And of course the teachers loved her because she was a perfectionist. But none of the other kids really liked her. So that same friend, her name's Jessica Kyle, Lacey shows up at her house and tells her friend that she's being molested by a bunch of family members. And of course they call CPS, but there's like no investigation done, but nevertheless, the family opens up their doors to Lacey so Lacey can kind of come and go as she pleases. And the Spears family has refuted this claim of molestation and said that it never happened. So take that as you will. So she starts calling this friend's mom, mom, and starts calling all of these older ladies that she befriends mom, which is totally weird. Like, I call my friend's mom, mom, and I call my boyfriend's mom, my bonus mom, but it would be weird to just start calling every single older lady that I meet mom. And it, apparently it made everyone else super uncomfortable too, which yeah, I imagine so. So something else that's like, I wanna point out, <laughs> they reported that this girl was being molested by her family members, and CPS did nothing. So again, CPS is useless. <laughs> every single case, every case that I report on when it has a horrible mother involved or child abuse involved, CPS is just useless. Now, Lacey and Jessica actually initially didn't get along. Apparently there was this issue where Lacey was hogging the monkey bars and then Jessica spit on her glasses, but the teacher made them make up and apparently they've been like inseparable best friends ever since. And Jessica even still stands by the fact that she believes that Lacey did not kill Garnet, which is her son. That's the victim that we're going to be talking about today. Um, jumping back to the American Girl doll thing, apparently Lacey would take the dolls wherever she went, even just like to the grocery store or to the playground. So it's, it's kind of weird that she'd bring them to all these places, but wanted them to look perfect all the time. Lacey also had this habit of telling these crazy stories that would get more and more out of hand if people didn't believe her. So she'd tell a lie, and then if someone didn't believe the lie, she would add more lies to the story. Um, if people didn't believe her lies, or if she didn't get the reaction that she wanted. She would tell people that she was a wet nurse, which is a person that breastfeed someone else's baby. She claimed that she had lost a previous baby. She had claimed that she had a brain injury from being a cheerleader. Um, that she had a blood disorder that required a bunch of blood transfusions. And of course none of it was true. It was all just lie after lie. And it got so bad that the few friends that Lacey did have actually planned this like intervention after um about the lies that, La that Lacey was telling because it eventually got too much. 
it would be like Lacey would tell people that she was absent from school because she needed to go out of town and when no one reacted to that she'd be like oh I had to go out of town because my grandmother is sick and then when no one reacted to that it would be oh my grandmother has cancer not just any cancer she has this deadly brain cancer and surprise Lacey has it too so it was just lie after lie she was just a compulsive liar so as Lacey gets older Lacey realizes that more than anything she wants to be a mom so she volunteered at this local church nursery and she loved it she loved working with kids and that's where she met and fell in love with this like one-year-old child named Charlie and I think at first the parents were okay with it with Lacey watching him but then after like not too long Charlie's parents said they absolutely did not want Lacey to watch Charlie because she made them uncomfortable with how affectionate she was towards Charlie. After Lacey graduated, she began working at this kids club in Decatur and she was just great at her job. She could look after multiple kids at once and she would work 12 hour shifts with no complaints. So of course her boss loved her. If anyone needed to give up a shift, they knew to go to Lacey because Lacey would gladly take the shift even if it meant that she was working 60 hours or more. <laughs> I hope to find a job one day that I love half as much as Lacey loves this job. So while she's working at the church nursery, she meets this young mom named Christy Burnham. And Christy had this baby whenever she was real young, when she was like 17. And she's a single mom and her baby's name is Cameron. So Christy is kind of struggling as a single mom. She's struggling to juggle work, parenting, and school. And Lacey offers, Lacey was taking college classes with Christy. And Lacey had dropped out and this kind of made Christy really relieved because since Lacey had dropped out she now had extra time on her hands and Lacey actually offered to watch Cameron while Christy had to juggle her work and her school so Lacey offers her this like massive discount to watch Cameron she buys some diapers a car seat a crib and never once asked Christy to pay her back for all of the expenses that Lacey was spending one day when Christy picked up Cameron, Christy noticed that Lacey was really angry whenever she picked him up and she couldn't figure out why, but she just kind of brushed it off. So one day, Christy brings Cameron to the park and this woman comes up to her and is like, oh, are you Lacey's babysitter? And she's like, what? No, I'm, I'm not Lacey. What? Lacey had apparently been saying that Cameron was her son. But when Christy confronts her about it, Lacey denied it. And Christy's feeling relieved because she's like, oh, there must have been a miscommunication here. There's no way that Lacey is saying that that Cameron is her son. There's there's just no way. So eventually Cameron starts getting these like awful ear infections. And eventually they had to have tubes put in his ears for these infections. And you'll find that these ear infections are very common in Lacey's circle. Um, Lacey apparently like called Christy bragging that Cameron had an ear infection. One day Lacey never drops Cameron off after babysitting. Next day rolls around, still no sign of Lacey and Cameron. Monday, still no Lacey. So finally Christy tracks down Lacey and is basically like, hey, if you don't bring my son home, I'm gonna beat the shit out of you. And she tells Lacey, hey, you're never watching my kid ever again. And Lacey breaks down sobbing, asking her, please don't take Cameron away from her. And it's just, it's weird. Who does that with someone else's kid? And I want to point out that Christy's mom was a very different story. Christy's mom loved Lacey because apparently Lacey, um, Christy's mom thought that Lacey was like a godsend because there were some issues between Christy and her mom. So Christy's mom just saw Lacey as this like perfect mother that she didn't see Christy as, which is incredibly sad, even more so in hindsight. So then Lacey meets this 19 year old named Autumn while she was working at a Jack's in Decatur seven years before Garnet's murder. Autumn has a six month old named Jonathan. Again, same song and dance. She offers Autumn this massive discount to watch her son, and Autumn accepts it. Lacey starts calling Jonathan John John. But this time it's even weirder. 
Lacey completely stopped asking for payment from Autumn. And she's buying formula, diapers, toys. And it's like, how are you affording all this if you're not getting payment? She starts taking John John to church. <laughs> claiming to be his mom to get donations. Lacey even posted photos of her and John on Facebook and said, Hey, Mommy Lacey. Like, pretending to be John. And then posting and saying, You are my world. My everything. You complete me. She would take John to football games and when people would ask her if John was her son, she would say yes. But then she'd be like, oh no, he's my nephew. And what's even more strange is when Autumn found out that Lacey was doing all this, she just kind of brushed it off and said she assumed that Lacey was doing it for attention. So then John starts getting these nasty ear infections. And they've got pus leaking out of them. And John even had a hole in his eardrum. And Shauna Lynch's son, McKelly, started getting these ear infections as well. Shauna would drop Shauna Shauna would drop McKelly off at Lacey's and even gave Lacey keys to her apartment because that's how much she liked Lacey. And it didn't help that Shauna felt bad for Lacey because Lacey had told her that her husband had been killed after they had been together since high school. They were high school sweethearts, she had been molested by her family. Lacey was just telling her all of these lies. But then McKelly starts getting those nasty ear infections that seem to run rampant in Lacey's inner circle. And these ear infections would only happen whenever Shauna would drop McKelly off with Lacey and John John. But Shauna doesn't really think anything of it. She just thinks it's a really unfortunate, I guess she just thinks it's a really unfortunate coincidence. However, Shauna's mom is smart. And Shauna's mom starts getting suspicious because Shauna never liked, or Shauna's mother never liked Lacey from the beginning. So Shauna's mother tells her to test Lacey just for her own peace of mind. Because anytime Shauna's mom would ask her questions about her personal life, Lacey would just get really evasive about it. So Shauna's mom tells her to take away the key from Lacey and tell her that it's not personal, that she's just working on her marriage, and that her husband doesn't want anyone to have keys to her house, and that if not, and that if nothing is weird, Lacey will react normally. Now, keep in mind that at this point, Lacey is spending like three or four days at Shauna's house a week. And Lacey would get angry whenever Shauna would ask her when she's leaving. Shauna asked if Lacey was planning on leaving and Lacey was just kind of like, well, why would I leave when I have everything here? A freeloader is basically what Lacey was, a freeloader. So, Shauna asks her for the keypad and you'd think Lacey would react normally, but no. Lacey flips out, starts cursing Shauna out, starts telling her that she's not a good friend and all of this awful stuff. Still, Shauna was the first person that Lacey actually told that she was pregnant and even sent photos of the ultrasound to Shauna but would never talk about who the father was so Shauna never pushed it. Lacey's friends actually hooked her up with this cop named Blake and they went on a few dates but one day when they were in the grocery store, Lacey just flips out for no reason on Blake and starts screaming at him. They were in the grocery line and she's just like screaming at him and I don't know exactly what she was screaming at him about but after that she never sees Blake again and of course her friends are confused because they're like what the hell happened I thought things were going good between y'all and Blake is gonna be a frequent character in Lacey's stories you'll find so there's this guy that lives downstairs from Lacey. His name is Chris something. I don't know, it's like Chris Hill or something like that. <laughs> wow, I'm good at reporting true crime. <laughs> she asks him to put this crib together for her. Probably for one of the many kids that she's planning on murdering their mother and stealing away in the middle of the night like Mother Gothel did to Rapunzel. But they end up doing it and they start doing it a lot like it becomes a frequent regular thing for them 
What's weird, though, is that even though Lacey loved kids, she wanted nothing to do with Chris's five-year-old child. Like, she'd completely ignore this five-year-old. I guess because the, the five-year-old wasn't a baby enough. I guess she wanted, like, a baby. And what else is weird is she would occasionally text Chris and tell him to come upstairs, and then she'd ignore him whenever he'd go and knock on the door. <laughs> That's so weird to me. So, of course, Lacey ends up pregnant. She took, like, 23 tests to make sure, and they were all positive, every single one of them. When people asked her who the father was, she, she would say, that older, fat, bald guy downstairs. Ma'am. So she tells Chris that she's pregnant. And Chris tries to make it work. He brings her this book of baby names and they had originally decided on the name Caden, but then out of the blue, Lacey is like, no, I'm gonna name him Garnet. And Chris is like, well, I don't like that name. And Lacey freaks out. And she's like, well, you're not the father anyway. It's my ex, Blake. And um, if you try and contact me again, I'm gonna call the cops on you. On December 3rd, 2008, Garnet Paul Thompson Spears was born at six pounds, 13 ounces. And within minutes of being born, Lacey was already posting a picture of him on Facebook with the caption, labored only four hours and my blessing is here. And she posted this to like four different Facebook accounts that she had. <laughs> it's weird, right? So everything was fine, but she got very visibly upset whenever her parents got there. And at first, Lacey seemed to handle single motherhood very well. And after Lacey had the baby, both her and Garnet were healthy, but they couldn't get through the weekend without Lacey going back to the hospital. Garnet was only two days old, but he was running a high fever and pulling at his ears, according to Lacey. Doctors ran tests, they couldn't find anything wrong with him. His temperature was normal, everything was normal, and so they sent both of them home. Once Lacey got home, she posted pictures of John and Garnet and captioned it, Big bro and little bro together, me and my babies, and they were in identical clothing. There was, there was another picture with the caption, brothers and best friends. And once Autumn, which was Jonathan's mom, which is Jonathan's mom, uh, found out that Lacey was this awful killer. She was shocked and she wanted Lacey to be innocent, which I get because she said she couldn't bear the thought of her child being around someone that often that had done that to her own child because she said it could have happened to her own child, which I don't want to be rude, but all this is happening and you're shocked. She's one step away from wearing your skin and calling herself Autumn. So Lacey goes back to the ER and she was saying that Garnet was sick again and they hooked him up to another IV and she took another photo and posted it saying, poor baby boy, see his IV, my entire world, he is my life. And it becomes like this every day. She marches to the hospital demands that the doctors run tests to make sure nothing is wrong with him. And meanwhile, she's constantly posting pictures of him from the hospital. Her friend said eventually, her friend said that it eventually got as disturbing, especially later on when we talk about the feeding tube and some of the more graphic photos, because who wants to be scrolling through Facebook and see a baby that's hooked up to tubes and just being so sick and all that. They said it was not what you expect to see and that they personally wouldn't do it, but that they thought maybe it was just her way of coping with everything. But they also said it was like she was using the hospital as a photo opportunity. She told the doctors that Garnet wasn't eating properly and that he was bleeding out of his ears, and the doctors made a note in Garnet's medical records that he suspected Lacey was suffering from Munchausen by proxy. Which if you don't know what Munchausen by proxy is, it's essentially when you make your child or anyone in your care sick, or you harm them to get attention. I have very strong opinions on Munchausen by proxy. And I don't, 
I don't think mine are very popular opinions on Munchausen by proxy because um, I'm sorry, I don't think if you actually love someone that's in your care that you could ever think about harming them. Again, that's, that's just my opinion. Don't come for me, as Stephanie Harlow would say. So the doctors call this organization, and I don't know entirely what the organization is called, but it's basically this organization to try and prevent child abuse. And they noticed that Lacey had basically ignored Garnet as well as any follow-up appointments and calls. So they just closed the case. <laughs> they just closed it. They said, oh, well, she's ignoring our calls and she's ignoring her child, so let's just, let's just close the case. I said it before and I'll say it again. What is with CPS and all these other organizations being absolutely useless? What's even more strange is you would think if this woman actually had Munchausen by proxy that she wouldn't be ignoring the attention that she wants. That she wouldn't be ignoring all these follow-up visits. Wouldn't Lacey be excited that all these people are noticing her and giving her attention? So Lacey shows up at the hospital more and more, saying that Garnet was throwing up everything, projectile vomiting at just six weeks old. But the doctors see the previous notes about the Munchausen and they don't tell Lacey that they have these notes. So they're trying this little experiment. They quarantine Garnet and they say no visitors so that way they can monitor him to see if Lacey is lying. Of course, Garnet isn't throwing up anything, but they still can't be sure if the vomiting is because of Lacey. So Lacey starts reaching out to her friends because she couldn't handle the stress. But her friends had noticed that anytime Lacey would talk and Garnet would interrupt, that Lacey would smack Garnet on the leg, which kind of shocked them because it wasn't like a, it wasn't like a, it was like a, like a, a hard smack. Like, to the point that they even called CPS, but again, CPS didn't do anything because CPS is useless. So Garnet was still malnourished, and doctors performed a Neeson fundoplication surgery, which is basically the surgery to stop someone from throwing up. But Lacey is still complaining, saying that Garnet's refusing to eat. So doctors give him a feeding tube placed in his nose at only two months old. Of course, she takes a photo of it. Posted on Facebook. Once they release him, she goes back to the hospital and claimed he still wasn't eating. They checked his sodium levels, which were at 180. <laughs> Normal levels are supposed to be between 135 and 145. And if, it's, if sodium levels are too high, they can be fatal. Keep in mind, he's only about two months old at this point. Too much sodium can it travel to the water in the brain, and that's how it can be fatal. So they airlift him to Children's Hospital where they safely lowered his sodium level. All while Lacey is just posting these gory photos of Garnet on Facebook. And again, I wanna make it clear, I will never post photos of a harmed child in my videos. <coughs> I'm sure these photos are somewhere out there, but you don't have to worry about seeing them in my video. So they keep Garnet for two weeks, and they still can't figure out why his sodium levels were so high since he was fine in every other way. They asked Lacey what she was giving Garnet, and she told them one part formula, half strength with three parts water, and they were like, um, he's malnourished because that's way too diluted. CPS was contacted even though Lacey claimed that doctors told her to give Garnet this mixture. Again, CPS did nothing. I think this is one of the worst cases of CPS failing that I have ever covered so far because there were so many opportunities for CPS to step in and be like, Oh yeah, something's way fucking wrong. But they didn't do anything. With Jeanette, she was, she was very much failed by CPS and multiple calls were made, but... In this one, even doctors were contacting CPS, and CPS still wasn't doing anything. What the fuck? So Garnet was discharged from the hospital, and once again, Lacey took a photo of him and captioned it, knocked out and on pain meds. My little man had to be sick again. Poor baby boy. Yeah, okay, lady, you're the one making him sick. 
you absolute scum of the earth. I know people might be like, but here's the thing. Having a mental illness is one thing. I have sympathy for people who have mental illness. I don't have sympathy when that mental illness causes you to harm someone, especially not someone vulnerable like your baby. Now, in certain cases, it's different. Andrea Yates, a very different story specifically, which I do have a video planned on Andrea Yates because that case really breaks my heart. And what happened should have never happened. But Lacey didn't want help. She wanted attention. And that's why I have an issue. So Lacey's friends reach out to her and they all offer support. And here's the kicker. <laughs> they all meet up at this Mexican restaurant. And you know how Lacey is going on and on about how Garnet can't keep anything down and he can't eat? Yeah, her friends saw her feeding him hot salsa and chips at this Mexican restaurant. He's less than a year old and they're all like, what the hell, Lacey? Isn't he super sick? What is wrong with you? So at this point, the hospital she normally goes to is getting like super suspicious, I guess. So she opts to go to this different hospital, telling them that Garnet has these bloody ear infections. She also tells them that he's throwing up, that he can't keep anything down. So they start bringing nurses in. And Lacey is telling them that he threw up, but they realize that Garnet isn't throwing up because remember, he had that surgery. And that's when Lacey just won't acknowledge anything that they say and she just kind of leaves the room. So these ear infections that Garnet is getting are so bad to the point that Garnet has to have towels under his ears to catch the drainage coming out of his ears. And doctors keep calling CPS, but nothing's getting done. Because again, CPS is useless because we live in a world where CPS won't, won't do anything. Lacey keeps going to the hospital even when she's visiting her grandparents, telling hospitals that she, he needs a G-tube, which is a feeding tube connected to your stomach. And despite doctors saying he does not need one since it's extremely invasive and painful and that Garnet was able to keep everything down, she finally has a doctor that will give him one on September 1st. They placed a one and a half inch plastic tube into his stomach and as soon as the tube got installed, Lacey posted a photo. So there's no way for Garnet to throw up and she can put anything she wants in that feeding tube. So let's jump around for a minute. In February of 2011, Lacey moved to Clearwater, Florida to live with her paternal grandmother named Peggy because she claimed that the weather was better for Garnet's health. She made friends with a neighbor across the street named Kim Philipson, and Kim said that she noticed that Lacey and Garnet were happy, but any time that her parents visited, she would get very upset. She told Kim that her father molested her and that Garnet was a product of it. And she also told Kim that when her father was visiting, she had gotten pregnant by him and had a miscarriage. And that's kind of when Kim walked over to Lacey's grandmother's house and basically told Lacey's mom that they needed to leave and never come back. And Lacey's grandmother, Lacey's grandmother told Kim that Lacey had a truthfulness issue. And that's when Kim cut off all contact with Lacey. So <laughs> Lacey starts telling everyone that she wants to have another baby and to name this one Granite. So she's, she's gonna have Garnet and Granite. I don't wanna laugh at anyone's baby name choices, but Granite. <laughs> and here's what's wild. Here's the wild part. Her friends, her friend offered up her husband to sleep with since Lacey was a single mom. And Lacey did so more than once. It was a bunch of times that Lacey slept with this friend's husband. And then the wife realizes that it was a bad idea. So to fix it, the wife was like, oh, I know. Let's have a threesome. <laughs> that doesn't work either, obviously. So the friend decides to cut all contact with her. She also at one point had said she wanted to adopt a child with Down syndrome and everyone was like, oh my God, you're so brave. You already have your hands full of garnet and you want to adopt another child. Oh my God, I could never do what you do, Lacey. You want to take on another child, another sick child. 
I don't know if that was dramatic, but that's that's probably what they said. Her friends had also noticed that Lacey would hold Garnet underwater while he screamed, and they had to scream at her to stop. And this happened while she was bathing Garnet, by the way. And it wasn't like warm water either. It was freezing cold water that she would hold him under. And she did this all because he played with a hose. So she posts on Facebook again and says, Feeling like a horrible mother tonight. Screamed at my child because he screamed at me. Worst of all, I gave him a freezing cold bath because I asked him not to play with the hose. I cried, held him as he slept, asked for forgiveness. Man, did I blow it tonight. Basically just feeling sorry for herself and demanding sympathy from others, but um, a lot of people didn't give her sympathy. You'll find that it's common that Lacey would, like, abuse Gar like abuse Garnet and then she would like hold him and comfort him and it just it feels like love bombing to me is what it feels like. I'm pretty sure there's another term for it. If you know if you know it let me know in the comments below. Is it love bombing or is there a different term for it? Now I know I'm gonna get people that are like oh, you're gonna say because you're not a child. You don't have a child. But I'm also like no, I don't have kids, but I'm also not so awful of a human being that I would give a child a freezing cold bath as a punishment, you weirdo. Her friends also started noticing that she wanted to be like them in every single way, including how they looked. So if one got a haircut, she'd get a haircut. If one dyed their hair, she'd dye their hair. She'd dye her hair. It's very peel your skin off and wear it as a suit type thing. You can think of me as your sister. Well, what's the matter? Call me Emily if you want. So eventually, Lacey got fed up with modern medicine and focused on being a crunchy mom. We love them. Every time, every time I read Crunchy Mom, I just think, like, young living. She starts focusing on herbs and going vegan and even started this new blog called The Hippie Happy Blog and another one called Garnet Paul's Healthy Journey Son's Medical Process. And meanwhile, Florida CPS leaves this note in Lacey's file that Garnet has lost about 50% of his hearing, bleeds from the ears, nose, and eyes, and that Lacey will slap him as hard as she can before soothing him. So again, like I said, she'll abuse him before she'll comfort him. And it's just, it's really disgusting. They did interviews with Lacey, but eventually just closed the case. Useless! So Lacey posts on Facebook saying that Garnet asked about his father. And I found the post, and I'll actually insert it here if you want to read it but basically she gave him the answer when he asked where his dad was saying that his dad was in him and that half of him was in him and that half of him was in her it's, it's very strange and i just it, it makes me uncomfortable to read knowing what i know the the comments were all in support of her because of course at this point she's got everyone fooled so here's what it says here's what the post says it's titled Mommy, where's my daddy? And it was posted on Friday, June 3rd, 2011. <clears throat> I'm just going to do a dramatic reading. Let me just get some water first. I hate this woman. And I am going to use every opportunity to mock her. <clears throat> like any other morning in our home, I stood at the kitchen sink somewhere between 1 a.m. and 3 a.m. washing dishes. Why are you washing dishes at whatever. It was something that had to be done, so the time meant nothing. I peered through the kitchen window to see my son peacefully sitting in his rock chair watching cartoons. Yes, that's right. One in the morning, and he's awake. He decides when we start our day. I peacefully accepted that there will be a day when he sleeps, but for now we enjoy our early mornings, thinking about what needed to be done that day and how to make our errands, errands, no D, doctor visits, whatever it may be as fun and peaceful for Garnet, I was lost in foe, in foe, only be drowned back to reality when a little hand pulled on my shorts and said, Mommy, where is my daddy? All in caps. 
Now I had spent some time pondering how I would answer this question, and this wasn't the first time he had asked, but I knew f until I felt safe answering him, he would continue to ask, do I give details? Do I tell the truth? Do I butter it up for him? As a parent, we want to protect our child from anything that could harm or hurt them, so answering this simple question was a challenge. But I had finally found a way to explain to Garnet just where his daddy was. I placed the dish I was washing in the sink, dried my hands, bent down to his level so he would know I was fully connected to him. I looked my son in the face and said, your daddy is in you. He is in your ears, eyes, nose, arms, legs, heart, and soul. Your daddy is half of you and mommy is the other half. I thought to myself, okay, I answered him. Garnet just peered at me for a moment and with a sweet, blissful voice replied, awesome and ran off <laughs> awesome i thought how could someone at such a young age find that awesome nevertheless he thought it was awesome and for today he is pleased and at peace with my answer i know the day will come when garnet asks again where his daddy is but for today he thinks it's awesome that his daddy is in his ears eyes mouth nose arm no matter where garnet's father is he will always be in him and he will always be a part of him so that's dramatic. <laughs> so here's where it starts really getting good, y'all. The interest in her Facebook page had died down. So of course, she's got to bring it back up. She decides she's got to kill off Blake, which is Garnet's father, by the way. Blake, the cop. Yeah, she decides she's got to kill him off. She kills him off in the line of duty and made this post duty <laughs> and made this post that basically said that Garnet had woken up from a deep sleep and said mommy daddy loves you and that's how she knew that Blake was with them my best friend my strength my unfailing love and support and posted a photo with it which okay don't come for me on this but kids can be creepy and I have to say, if my pretend child woke up from a dead sleep and told me, Mommy, Daddy loves you, like, I would just fucking, sorry kid, but we gotta go to the church, we gotta get you exercised. So this friend from high school sees this post and reverse image searched it and found it was a stock photo and posted a screenshot of her, like, search results. And... And immediately Lacey deleted the comment and, and blocked her. And I'm just imagining like some r slash stop your bullshit or like when Herbalife tried saying that Meghan Markle used Herbalife and posted that horribly photoshopped photo and someone posted the reverse image in the comments. <laughs> on Father's Day, she also wrote on her blog, we survived another Father's Day without Blake. So... In the first two and a half years that Garnet was alive, he was in the hospital 33 times, had been air flighted twice, and had 12 different surgeries for God knows what this bitch made him get surgery for. Sorry, y'all. Had to take my hair down. It was starting to hurt my head. There was also this thing where she had claimed to bre have breastfed a stranger's baby on the street in this weird post. I can't find the post, but... Even though Garnet is three and it was formula fed and when someone pointed that out, they also got their comment deleted and got blocked. So Lacey begins to look for a new place to live and finds one in 2012, 14 months prior to Garnet's death, called the Fellowship at Chestnut Ridge in New York, which is this like alternative lifestyle community that's very isolated from the outside world. So she hears about this community and is like, I'm moving here. It's going to be good for him. And this place really focused on healthy living and vegan lifestyle. And people even donated $800 to help her move. She lived in Tulip House in a room with no lock that was like a big residential hotel room. And Valerie Johnson immediately became friends with Garnet. And she basically was like the head of fellowship and took care of everything and was like Lacey's boss. Lacey had a job taking care of the elderly and disabled in exchange for free rent and food. 
and she referred to Garnet as Garnet the Great. I'm not sure if I ever mentioned that, but at Fellowship, she immediately started telling everyone her sob story, her lies. She started telling them about Blake and Garnet's health problems that she was causing. And everyone felt bad for her as any decent human would. She starts telling people that Garnet's esophagus is only a quarter of the size it should be and that he would go days without eating because he couldn't swallow, which is a brand new lie that she hasn't told anyone yet. That lie kind of fell apart though because everyone noticed that Garnet ate everything even without the tube. They also noticed that Lacey would get mad at Garnet and would pull on his arm so hard that it looked like it was going to rip out of his socket. And again, he'd start crying and she'd soothe him immediately. Fuck this woman. But once she moved to New York, her attention on Facebook really started to die down. She begins taking Garnet to doctors where they tell Lacey that he needs a feeding evaluation, which is basically where they see how much Garnet will eat by mouth versus with the tube. But Lacey adamantly refused to let them do this evaluation. She starts talking about how Garnet was too sick to go to school, and at school they actually said he didn't seem sick at all, which I guess when you don't have an evil bitch poisoning you, you don't get sick. I mean, really, fuck this woman. I hate this woman. I hate her so much. On October 6, 2011, Lacey googled Bake... <laughs> Bake Robinson. <laughs> Blake Robinson of Moulton, Alabama, which is the ex that she killed off. Her other searches included... Normie, normie. Her other searches included normal sodium levels for a child, and a few hours after school, Garnet was brought to the hospital for a fever, but they detected nothing, so they sent her home. Within a 30 minute span, she searched eight more times. Elevated sodium in children, dangers of high sodium levels in a child. What happens to someone if they have a high sodium level in the blood? At 2 p.m. that Friday, one of Lacey's friends gets a call from her. And she says, oh my God, it's happening again. Garnet's having seizures. I need a car. So her friend rushes over and expects them to be waiting outside, but sees nothing. So she thinks maybe with all of Garnet's medical equipment that maybe Lacey is having a hard time getting it all together. So she goes inside and sees Lacey standing near the couch while Garnet is just in pain, groaning and moaning hooked up to his feeding tube, and her friend is confused because just a few moments ago, she was panicking. She also noticed that there was a milk-colored liquid in the feeding bag, which is unusual because Lacey only gives Garnet greens. Her friend was like, Lacey, we gotta go, and Lacey is like calmly packing, saying how she wanted to drive, and how she would drop her friend off at her house and just drive herself, even though her friend offered to drive. <clears throat> Lacey's texting people the whole time saying how scared she is and she parks at the hospital and takes a photo with him. Takes a photo of him in the car seat. Ma'am, what? I understand you don't have a single functioning brain cell in that mess to pet of yours, but like, come on, lady. So at the hospital, she's telling the doctors about Garnet's previous high sodium levels and how it was like 200 before and the doctors were like, uh, that's not possible. He would be either dead or had serious brain damage. And he didn't have brain damage and he was very clearly alive. So like, what? The doctors were in tests and the whole time Lacey is screaming how Garnet is having on and off again seizures. And the doctors aren't finding any seizure activity in his brain. But they hooked him up to an EEG machine because seizures come and go quick. Now I've had one of these tests done before and they had to monitor me for like 72 hours and they put these like things all over my head and it was wrapped in gauze. It was kind of an annoying time and I'm sure for a child it was probably miserable. But Lacey was just kind of like whatever about it. She didn't really care what they did to Garnet. They hooked him up to an IV because they wanted a complete blood count and the whole time Lacey is on Facebook asking her friends to bring her and Garnet food. But it had to be vegan food, no gluten, dairy, or meat, and so the hospital food was not acceptable. 
Which, why do I get the feeling that Lacey is, like, one of those fake vegans that, like, will be like, oh, yeah, I'm vegan, but I totally eat McDonald's nuggets because it's not real meat. Barnett thankfully starts getting better, and he starts acting like a normal five-year-old, and the nurses disconnect his feeding tube, washed it, and handed it to Lacey before closing his port. And the whole time, Lacey is Googling, what is ionized salt? Why buy ionized salt? What's in ionized salt? Brain tumors, abnormal brain activity, and central nervous system. The doctors were going to send Garnet home, but Lacey protested. She was like, no, absolutely not. Something is wrong with him. You have to keep him. So the EEG machine actually had a camera on it because they had to cap they had to capture any minor seizure activity and what it looks like and the EEG actually caught Lacey taking Garnet into the bathroom out of view and he was happy on the way in Lacey walks out goes to her purse out of view is seen walking back in with the connector feeding tube and a large cup filled with something they were in the bathroom for the next three minutes. Lacey opened Garnet's feeding port, took a syringe filled with the liquid from the cup that contained high amounts of salt before jamming it into the connector tube, which sent this lethal dose of poison straight into Garnet. Because remember, she can feed him whatever she wants and he can't throw it up. When you see him next on camera, he can barely sit up in his bed. He's rubbing his nose and is obviously very scared. Lacey puts the things back into her purse, has a blank look, leans over Garnet after going to the other side of the bed to make sure the feeding port is closed and is sitting there watching him. Lacey picks up the nurse button moved it closer to where her hand was and on camera you see Garnet kneeling on his bed his little body twisting and the whole time he's dry heaving because keep in mind he can't throw up because of the surgery any normal person would be able to throw up this lethal amount of salt but Garnet can't because of this unnecessary surgery that this monster made him get at only two months old. Lacey clicks the button and starts patting him on the back, telling him that it's gonna be okay. Garnet is screaming and asking for water, which is weird because whenever you're nauseated, the idea of water makes you wanna throw up. But he's so dehydrated because of all the salt that he's just begging for water. He had explosive diarrhea through his diaper and through the bed sheets. He was shivering. The doctors are checking his liver, kidneys, and blood. The whole time, of course, you guessed it, Lacey is posting photos on Facebook. All right, I've been angry this whole time, but here's where I'm getting really angry. What kind of monster sees their child with explosive diarrhea and is so sick and is vomiting and all this and thinks, yeah, this is a good far, this is a good photo opportunity. This is so far beyond Munchausen by proxy. Lacey is getting the attention that she wants from doctors. What more does this rancid bitch want? Thankfully, with the help of the doctors and the nurses, Garnet starts getting better. He starts drinking water and stabilizing. Six hours later, though, at 4.30 p.m., Lacey drags Garnet back into the bathroom. When he comes out, he looks like he was just ready for it to end again. The investigators have said that this video will haunt them forever. They said it is the worst thing they have ever seen in their entire careers and that it will haunt them for the rest of their lives. Lacey cleans him up and sat in the bed. Ten minutes go by and she hits the emergency call button. She tells the doctors and the nurses that the same stuff is happening. And the nurse noticed that his G-port was open. And tells Lacey. Lacey closed it. But the nurse at the time didn't really think anything of it. It wasn't until she started getting questioned that she really thought about it. And that's when she started talking. Garnet didn't get better this time. He's rolling in pain. Lacey's texting her friends all about it. Less than an hour later, Lacey screams that Garnet is having a seizure. She says, look at him. Look at him. Like he's a circus act. Garnet is peeing blood. 
His eyes are moving around in his head. His oxygen levels start falling, so they have to put him on life support. Lacey's posting on Facebook saying, pray like crazy, G is not well. Garnet's lab results come back and it shows that he had a jump in his sodium levels from 144 to 182. And Lacey says, oh, I was expecting that since his previous incidents of high sodium that I told you about. And the whole time she's saying this, she's got this wide smirk on her face. I have, I have chills thinking about it. Doctors go to run more labs, but they want to airlift him to Westchester Medical Center, and they tell Lacey to get in the helicopter, but she's like, no, I don't want to go. I'm scared. I'll just have my friend bring me, which <laughs> I get being scared, but lady, your kid is dying. Get in the damn helicopter. Get in the fucking robot, Shinji. Eventually, though, they convinced Lacey to get in this helicopter. And, of course, the first thing Lacey did was go on Facebook and tell everyone, which you can expect at this point, that if there is a big event, that Lacey is posting about it on Facebook. So if something major happens with Garnet, Lacey's posting about it on Facebook. So that friend that had brought Lacey to the hospital, she overhears Lacey being questioned at Westchester and realized that Lacey wasn't being honest about most of Garnet's previous medical problems, which... The hospital is questioning her because they're suspicious. Lacey knew this, which is why she's keeping quiet. This friend doesn't know that. So anytime they'd ask her like a question and Lacey would lie about it, this friend starts speaking up. So if they would ask something and Lacey would give a wrong answer, this friend would chime in and be like, no, that's not right. Here's what happened. And Lacey knows it's digging her a hole and it pissed Lacey off. For now though, Questioning Lacey was put on the back burner and they told Lacey not to give Garnet anything because it could literally kill him. Then Garnet's sodium levels start going down and doctors want to remove his tube. But Lacey didn't want that because she claimed that she didn't want to make Garnet uncomfortable. Liar. Doctors explained to Lacey, they're like, hey, you know, if we don't take his tube out, he could get an infection and the tube could get dislodged. So <clears throat> they take the tube out against what Lacey wants because it's what's best for Garnet. The church starts this like GoFundMe for Garnet's medical bills and doctors are excited about his progress because at this point Garnet is talking and he's actually asking for water. The doctors only let him have enough to wet his lips because at this point he's still very fragile and could die. But Lacey is telling Facebook Garnet is screaming in pain and his head hurts, laid his, laid his bed flat to see how he feels. Now keep in mind, the doctors have told Lacey not to give Garnet anything at all. The emergency button in Garnet's room starts going off. So they rush in to the room and the first thing that they notice in Lacey's hand is a bottle of Polish spring water. She has given him water. So the doctors tell, yelled at the nurses to get the bottle away from Lacey. And they kick Lacey out of the room. Garnet's pupils were blown. He, they, they weren't reacting to light. And here's what baffles me. Were the doctors not notified that Lacey was being investigated for harming her child? Why would they let Lacey go anywhere near Garnet? if they know that, if they suspect that she's hurting him? Is there some kind of law that says that legally they have to let her near him? Let me know in the comments if you know. Lacey's calling her friends, saying how Garnet stopped breathing and is back on the ventilator. Doctors are running tests and scanning his brain, but the test revealed that he was brain dead. The salt had shifted to the water in his brain cells, which caused them to swell with nowhere to go which led to them pressing against the skull. So Lacey runs out of the room and is screaming on the walls, is screaming on the, f on the floor, screaming how torn up she is over Garnet, is, is laying there for like, <laughs> crying for like an hour and a half. I'm laughing because it's comical when you know that she's the one that killed him. Garnet was in the hospital for days because the process to declare someone legally brain dead is very lengthy because it takes two doctors' opinions to declare someone legally brain dead. 
The police investigation found out that Lacey had taken hundreds of photos of Garnet brain dead. Hundreds of photos of her brain dead child. She posts multiple updates in quick succession. And the, do the hospital had called dozens of specialists, police, and even called CPS to investigate because they were shocked at Lacey's behavior, which... You're shocked. Really. There were no warning signs, right? There were no warning signs that she could possibly be dangerous and could possibly be hurting her child. No one gave you any warning, right? <laughs> Ridiculous. Imagine being shocked at someone's behavior. Which we're going to get into what her behavior was, but imagine being shocked at all this. When you're CPS and you've done literally nothing to try and help this child. So this woman was sobbing, but no tears were coming out. She, when they'd ask her a question about Garnet's medical history, she would stop her sobbing, sit up straight, and answer everything perfectly normal, but then she'd start sobbing again. <laughs> it reminds me of Regina George from that scene from Mean Girls when she gives Mr. Duvall the burn book, <laughs> and he's like, um, uh, what's her name is a... And then she's like, she goes from crying and she's like, fat whore. What's that saying? <laughs> Caitlin Causen is a... Fat whore. <laughs> Dr. Cantor tied this event to a spike in sodium levels because there was no reasonable explanation for his sodium levels to be that high. Lacey told the doctors that she had recently gotten into holistic medicine and her family even covered for her during the investigation while Lacey kept her mouth shut during it. The police get a search warrant for Lacey's house, but it's super neat, which is weird because she left in such a hurry, supposedly. So you'd think that it would be a lot more messy. In the kitchen, she has this shrine for Garnet and she has his medication, a huge box of sea salt, and his feeding bag was hooked up in the living room. Another feeding bag was in a garbage bag and it was filled with white liquid just like the other one and they didn't think to take it because they assumed it was milk. <sighs> what the fuck? You're supposed to take everything in an investigation, right? So it turns out that Lacey's friend Valerie had actually cleaned up Lacey's apartment at Lacey's request, and so she gave detectives Carby, Greg Dunn, and Budnick Garnet's feeding bag that she had removed from the house that Lacey had asked her to take. And she had no clue why Lacey had asked her to get rid of it, but thankfully she didn't. So the police took pictures of everything when they were there, and they ended up taking three bags of evidence, including all the medicines that Garnet was on. The bag was tested and it showed high contents of sodium, 20 grams, which is equivalent to 69 restaurant salt packets that she had given Garnet. And none of these surgeries were necessary either. 69 salt packets. So Lacey starts Googling how much insulin it takes to kill yourself because she knows she's about to be caught. And she's constantly on Facebook blaming the hospital for Garnet's death. No responsibility of her own, piece of shit. <coughs> She's mad at the police for accusing her of killing Garnet. And here's what's crazy of me. Here's what's crazy to me. This bitch tried to take money from Garnet's medical fund for her attorney fees, but the manager of it refused and, and refunded everyone their money because of it. So Lacey starts unfriending people and deleting things on Facebook, so the police have to get this search warrant super quick. Her social media records were close to 50,000 pages long. She had multiple Twitter accounts, Instagrams, MySpaces, and a new phone because the old one was getting taken by the police. It was actually suggested by a nurse. I don't know if I mentioned that. It was actually suggested by a nurse that the police check the EEG machine because the EEG machines have those cameras 
And that's actually how they caught Lacey on camera killing Garnet. Lacey was found guilty and said, I can't believe the judge said I have Munchausen by proxy. He has no training as a psychiatrist and there's no way that I'm suffering from that. Well, lady, the fact that you have Munchausen by proxy is the reason that you got a shorter sentence. So you should be thankful for that. She swore that Garnet was killed by the hospital. <laughs> and the inmates currently hate her. So, um, rightfully so. If you know anything about inmates, you'd know that they hate anyone that harms a child. So they hate, um, child abusers, um, child molesters. And so they've, they, they just put heavy amounts of salt in her food. <laughs> um, she was sentenced to 30 years to life and has a possible release date of 2034. And during the sentencing, Lacey turned away for most of it. The times when you could see her face, she was either crying or stone cold. And when asked if she wanted to say anything she, before her sentencing, she just said, no, sir. The state asked for the max penalty while the defense asked for the minimum. So the judge split the difference and that's how he came up with the sentence. Assistant Westchester County DA Doreen Lloyd said at sentencing, quote, Garnet Spears should be in school, and he's not, because his mother murdered him. He had a right to grow up, and a right to grow old, and she stole that from him. Your Honor, her actions were beyond depraved, despicable, and evil. I gotta agree with that. Judge Robert Neary acknowledged that Lacey has Munchausen, and that's why he didn't give her the maximum. And she's currently in Bedford Hills Correctional Facility for Women and her murder conviction was up, upheld in state appellate court and the state's highest court declined to review her conviction. And that, and that is the awful story of the murder of Garnet Spears and the story of this awful woman who killed him and Garnet should still be alive today like Miss Doreen Lloyd said, this was a tough one. My first true crime video back and I pick a case about children, about kids. Cases about kids are always hard for me to get through because anytime I think of kids, I think of my brother. He's only 15, but it just, I can't fathom someone hurting their own child. And I want to know what y'all think of this one. Personally, I think she should have gotten a longer sentence. I think she should have gotten the maximum penalty, which is life in prison, not 30 years to life. I don't think she has Munchausen syndrome. I'm going to be completely honest. I don't think she has Munchausen. I don't think she has Munchausen. I just think this is a purely evil woman. And that's all I really have to say. So, let me know what you think in the comments below, and I will see you all in my next one. Bye!